Hello. What's up? Hey. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Scary Talk. My name is Andre, and today I'm joined by a very special guest, my dearest enemy, Jared. Jared, how are you doing today? Um, pretty good, Andre. I don't know about that uh that intro, but I guess we'll just go from there. I, I I think we should. You know, my dearest friend, it's just it's just too close for comfort. So I think I'm gonna keep a little bit of distance for now until we become better acquainted. But for now, you know, you're still my best something. So it's fair something. enough. As long as I hold an important spot in your life. <laughs> no. Hi everyone. Uh, Scary Talk episode 60, whatever, honestly, it depends on what order I want to release this in, but, um, uh, Jared, please do introduce yourself. Who are you? How do we know each other? Uh, and why are you here? All right. Um, hi everyone. My name's Jared. I'm, uh, friends with Andre. I went to high school with him and he is very good friends with my girlfriend and I have had some, uh, exposure to andre through those means um kind of unwilling on my part but um it's yeah. kind of kind of how it goes sometimes you know and here we are now recording a podcast episode together so isn't that nice um uh, i dragged jared um into this episode just because i've been wanting to have a couple guests lately and um i figured you know jared's kind of what's left bottom of the barrel so why not do it and also he's available so here we are definitely and, available uh, <laughs> Uh, and today we're reading some uh, creepypasta for you. That's what we're doing. Um, insert spooky sound here. We are reading some creepypasta for you today. Um, uh, in all seriousness, Jared, thank you for being here today. I really do appreciate your presence. Um, so let's get this yeah, started. Yeah, sure, sure thing, man. Just wanted to uh, take a break between 90 Day Fiancé, you know. Do, do a little <laughs> creepypasta. We do love watching a good 90 Day Fiancé episode, don't we? It's That's a good show. That's a good, I've been thinking, by the way, that maybe we should... Um, um, well, honestly, it's going to be a minute before we go through all that show, if we even manage to do that. But I know that 90 Day Fiance, before the 90 Days, I think it is, is really hot right now. Because there's a couple called um, Ed and Rose. He's from America. She's from, like, the Philippines. And there's, like, a bunch of clips on YouTube of them, like, every day. It's, like, a really, really popular couple right now. So... We could save that for the 90 Day Fiancé podcast, you know? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah, when that eventually <laughs> happens, as it, as it inevitably will. Um, uh, Jared, I'm going to get us started with... I, I'm not even going to talk coronavirus because I've touched on that every single episode before this one so hi everyone yes we're still in a pandemic whatever now i'm gonna read <laughs> the first creepypasta for today have you heard jared have you heard of mr white mouth um no no i don't think i have okay well prepare yourself to become terrorized because this is this is that story this is that story my man edge of my seat <laughs> yes <laughs> um here we go during my childhood, my family was like a drop of water in a vast river. Never re- never re- <laughs> already fucked up. I'm leaving that in. That's all the parts that people love. Never remaining in one location for long. We settled in Rhode Island when I was eight, and there we remained until I went to college in Colorado Springs. Most of my memories are rooted in Rhode Island, but there are fragments in the attic of my brain which belong to the various homes we had lived in when I was much younger. Most of these memories are unclear and pointless, chasing after another boy in the backyard of a house in North Carolina, trying to build a raft to float on the creek behind the apartment we rented in Pennsylvania, and so on. But there is one set of memories which remains as clear as glass, as though they were just made yesterday. I often wonder whether these memories are simply lucid dreams produced by the long sicknicks. Sicknicks. God, what the fuck? <laughs> Leaving that in as well. Words are hard. On it, it. I experienced that spring, but in my heart, I know they're real. Now, what do you think he's talking about? Um, ghosts, question mark? Mm, I don't think we actually fully ever get to find out, but I mean, here we go. We were living in a house just outside the bustling metropolis of New Vineyard, Maine, population 643. Sounds great. It was a large structure, especially for a family of three. There were a number of rooms that I didn't see in the five months we resided there. In some ways, it was a waste of space, but it was the only house on the market at the time, at least within an hour's commute to my father's place of work. 
The day after my fifth birthday, attended by my parents alone, hashtag sad, I came down with a fever. The doctor said I had mononucleosis, which meant no rough play and more fever for at least another three weeks. It was horrible timing to be bedridden. We were in the process of packing our thing. By the way, okay, quick next side note. I had a friend who had mono, I won't say his name. It was Austin. Um, uh, he, in high school, he was my next door neighbor. Um, it sucked. He, like, felt terrible for a long time, and I feel bad. Um, he did lose, like, 25 pounds, though, and then I was like, oh, my God, we stand a skinny king. Like, Dude, how'd you do that? What's your secret? It lasts for it lasts for multiple months sometimes. That shit is yeah, no yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, no. <sighs> my condolences, yeah, terrible. But, hey, <laughs> he came out of it the other side 25 pounds skinnier. So, honestly... Okay. Yeah, yeah nice, diet. So, nice diet. So, just saying. I guess. Now, um, his fifth birthday, only his parents went. Hashtag sad. He came down with a fever. He has mono now. What's next? So, we were in the process of packing our things to move to Pennsylvania, and most of my things were already packed away in boxes, leaving my room barren. My mother brought me ginger ale and books several times a day, and these served the function of being my primary form of entertainment for the next few weeks. Boredom always loomed just around the corner, waiting to rear its ugly head and compound my misery. I don't exactly recall how I met Mr. Whitemouth. I think it was about a week after I was diagnosed with mono. My first memory of the small creature was asking him if he had a name. He told me to call him Mr. Whitemouth because his mouth was large. In fact, everything about him was large in comparison to his body, his head, his eyes, his crooked ears. All large. But his mouth was by far the largest. You look kind of like a Furby, I said, as he flipped through one of my books. Mr. Whitemouth stopped and gave me a puzzled look. Furby? No, I should have given him a voice. Furby? What? No, you know what? No, uh, Furby? Uh, what's a Furby? He's Italian. He asked. <laughs> I shrugged. <laughs> you know, the toy. The little robot with the big ears. You can pet and feed them, almost like a real pet. Oh, Mr. Whitemouth resumed his activity. You don't need one of those. They aren't the same as having a real friend. I remember. <laughs> Thank you. Classic yeah. Italian. Mr. I remember Wagner. Mr. White mouth disappearing every time my mother stopped by to check in on me. I lay under your bed. He later explained, "I don't want your parents to see me because I'm afraid they won't let us play anymore." We didn't do much during those first few days, and we're like breaking the mood completely with that. <laughs> 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 if your goal was immersion, um, you're not reaching that goal, but uh, okay, I like listen. it. We didn't do much during those first few days. Mr. Whitemouth just looked at my books, fascinated by the stories and pictures they contained. The third or fourth morning after I met him, he greeted me with a large smile on his face. I have a new game we can play, love, he said. We, <laughs> we have... <laughs> We've got to wait until after your mother comes to check on you because she can't see us play. It's a secret game. After my mother delivered more books and soda at the usual time, Mr. Whitemouth slipped out from under the bed and tucked my hand. Okay, fine. We have to go to the room at the end of this hallway, he said. I objected at first, as my parents had forbidden me to leave my bed without their permission, but Mr. Whitemouth persisted until I gave in. The room in question had no furniture or wallpaper. Its only, dis its only distinguishing feature was a window opposite the doorway. Mr. Whitemouth darted across the room and gave the window a firm push, flinging it open. He then beckoned me to look out at the ground below. We were on the second story of the house, but it was on a hill, and from this angle the drop was farther than two stories due to the incline. I like to play pretend up here, Mr. Whitemouth explained. I pretend that there's a big, soft trample- wait, can I do it? I don't know if I can do a Christopher Walken impression, but I'm going to try. Mr. Whitemouth explained. I uh, pretend that there's a... No, I can't do it. It's okay. That's all right. I'll live. <laughs> if you pretend hard enough, you bounce back up like a feather. I want you to try. I was a five-year-old with a fever, so only a hint of skepticism darted through my thoughts as I looked down and considered the possibility. It's a long drop, I said. But that's all part of the fun. It wouldn't be fun if it was only a short drop. If it were that way, you may as well just bounce on a real trampoline. I toyed with the idea, picturing myself falling through thin air only to bounce back to the window on something unseen by human eyes. But the realist in me prevailed. Maybe some other time, I said. I don't know if I have enough imagination. I could get hurt. Mr. Widemouth's face contorted into a snarl, but only for a moment. Anger gave way to disappointment. If you say so, he said. He spent the rest of the day under my bed, quiet as a mouse. The following morning, Mr. Whitemouth arrived holding a small box. 
I want to teach you how to juggle, he said. Here are some things you can use to practice before I start giving you lessons. I looked in the box. It was full of knives. <laughs> my parents won't kill me, I shouted, horrified that Mr. Widemouth had brought knives into my room. Objects that my parents would never allow me to touch. I'll be spanked and grounded for a year. Mr. Widemouth frowned. It's fun to jiggle. It's fun to jiggle. <laughs> it's fun to juggle with these. <laughs> I want you to try it. I pushed the box away. I can't. I'll get in trouble. Knives aren't safe to just throw in the air. This five-year-old, super smart. Mr. Whitemouth's frown deepened into a scowl. He took the box of knives and slid under my bed, remaining there for the rest of the day. I began to wonder how often he was under me. That's fucking creepy. I started having trouble sleeping after that. Mr. Whitemouth often woke me up at night, saying he put a real trampoline under the window, a big one that I couldn't see in the dark. <laughs> I always declined and tried to go back to sleep, but Mr. Whitemouth persisted. Sometimes he stayed by my side until early in the morning, encouraging me to jump. He wasn't so fun to play with anymore. My mother came to me one morning and told me that I had her permission to walk around outside. She thought the fresh air would be good for me, especially after being confined to my room for so long. Wow, this is really, this is a really timely story. Hashtag COVID. Um, ecstatic, I put on my sneakers and trotted out to the back porch, yearning for the feeling of sun on my face. Mr. Whitemouth was waiting for me. I have something I want you to see, he said. I must have given him a weird look because he then said, it's safe, I promise. I followed him to the beginning of a deer trail, which ran through the woods behind the house. This is an important path, he explained. I've had a lot of friends about your age. When they were ready, I took them down this path to a special place. You aren't ready yet, but one day, I hope to take you there. I returned to the house, wondering what kind of place lay beyond that trail. Two weeks after I met Mr. Widemouth, the last load of our things had been packed into a moving truck. I would be in the cab of that truck, sitting next to my father for the long drive to Pennsylvania. I considered telling Mr. Widemouth that I would be leaving, but even at five years old, I was beginning to suspect that perhaps the creature's intentions were not to my benefit, despite what he said otherwise. For this reason, I decided to keep my departure a secret. My father and I were in the truck at 4am. He was hoping to make it to Pennsylvania by lunchtime tomorrow with the help of an endless supply of coffee and a six-pack of energy drinks. He seemed more like a man who was about to run a marathon, rather than one who was about to spend two days sitting still. Early enough for you? he asked. I nodded and placed my head against the window, hoping for some sleep before the sun came up. I felt my father's hand on my shoulder. This is the last move, son, I promise. I know it's hard for you, as sick as you've been. Once daddy gets promoted, we can settle down and you can make new friends. I opened my eyes as we blacked out of the driveway. I saw Mr. Widemouth's silhouette in my bedroom window. He stood motionless until the truck was about to turn to the main road. He gave a pitiful little wave goodbye, steak knife in hand, lit. I didn't wave back. Years later, I returned to New Vineyard. The piece of land or house stood upon was empty except for the foundation, as the house burned down a few years after my family left. Out of curiosity, I followed the deer trail that Mr. Widemouth had shown me. Part of me expected him to jump out from behind a tree and scare the living bejesus out of me, but I felt that Mr. Widemouth was gone, somehow tied to the house that no longer existed. The trail ended at the new Vineyard Memorial Cemetery. I noticed that many of the tombstones belong to children. That's the end. Yeah. I know, yeah. Mr. Widemouth was a little fucking murderer. That was... <laughs> that was sufficiently creepy. I just, I like that. The story clearly transitions from making you think that this is probably some kind of fever dream or hallucination because of his mono to like, oh, maybe this was some little weird fucking murdering cryptid creature that actually took kids and killed them. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm. That was Tough a good shit. one. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I like it. I like it. It's one of my favorites of all time. I just think it's so... I just think it's very well self-contained. Like, it's very simple. It happens in the span of, what... A couple, maybe a couple of weeks at most and mm -hmm. it's it doesn't go any super strange places which I'm a fan of sometimes but I think the story just plays out really well <sighs> I like it well that's enough of the yeah. literary analysis um, I need to make a joke or I'm gonna faint uh, poop titties okay it's your turn um, <laughs> what do you have for us I Jerry? Know. I don't know if how I can follow <laughs> poop titties but um, <laughs> yeah um, I'm not a creepypasta connoisseur like Andre um but I did spend a little bit of time trying to pick out a couple good ones. Um, so the one first one I'm going to read is uh, 
called If You're Armed and at the Glenmont Metro, Please Shoot Me. <laughs> I so, have never heard of this. <laughs> all right, that's good. You're in for a, you're in for a treat then, I think. Okay. Okay, so uh, begin scene. If you're armed and at the Glenmont Metro, please shoot me. Make it a headshot, shoot me in the temple, aiming slightly downwards. I need the bullet to travel the shortest possible distance through my brain before it hits my hippocampus. If I'm lucky, the sensation of the gunshot ripping through my skull will only last a few decades. As awful as this sounds, you'll be doing me an enormous favor. Death by headshot, as soon as possible, is vastly better than the alternative. My ordeal started over 10,000 years ago at 10.15 this morning. I earned that extra money by participating in drug trials. I'm a so-called healthy subject who takes experimental drugs to help assess side effects. Once it was a kidney drug, a few times it's been something for blood pressure or cholesterol. This morning they told me the drug I took was a psychoactive substance intended to accelerate brain function. None of the drugs I attested so far have ever done anything for me in the recreational sense. In other words, none of the drugs I've tested have given me a killer buzz or mellowed me out or anything. Maybe I've always ended up in the placebo group, but nothing I've tested had affected me at all. Today's drug was different. This shit worked. They gave me a pill at 10.15 and told me to hang out in the waiting room until they called me back for some tests. Only about 30 minutes, the research assistant told me. I flopped onto the waiting room couch and read a few articles from a copy of Psychology Today that were, were sitting on the coffee table. They hadn't called me back when I finished the Psychology Today, so I picked up a US News and read it cover to cover. Then I read an old Scientific American. What was taking them so damn long? I sluggishly turned my head to look at the wall clock. It was only 10.23 AM. I had read all three magazines in eight minutes. I remember thinking this was going to be a long day. I was right. The waiting room had a little bookshelf with some used hardcovers on it. When I stood up to walk to the bookshelf, it felt like my legs barely worked. It's not that they were weak, they were just slow. It took a full minute to stand up off the couch and another minute to take two steps to the bookcase. I scanned the old books on the shelf and picked out a copy of Moby Dick. My arms had the same problems as my legs. Just reaching one foot in front of me to grab the book took a long time. I actually got bored just waiting for my hand to reach the spine of the book. I slogged back to the couch and collapsed onto it in a slow motion fall that reminded me of the low gravity hops of astronauts on the moon. I opened Moby Dick slowly and began reading. I started with Call Me Ishmael and got as far as Ahab throwing his pipe into the sea, which was all the way to frickin' chapter 30 before they called me back. How are you feeling? The research assistant asked me. I feel slow, I said. Actually, it's the other way around. Everything seems slow because you're so fast. But my legs, my arms, they're moving in slow motion. Your body seems like it's moving slowly because your brain is fast. Your brain is running 10 or 20 times faster than normal. You are thinking and perceiving reality at an accelerated pace, but your body is still constrained by the laws of biomechanics. Frankly, you're moving much faster than a normal person. She pantomimed a jogging motion, but your brain is running so much faster right now that even your fast walk seems slow to you. I thought about my slow motion flop onto the waiting room couch. Even if my muscles had slowed down, my body would still react to gravity the same way, but in the waiting room I even fell in slow motion. Slow muscles couldn't explain why gravity seemed weaker. My brain was going at warp 10. That's how I managed to read three magazines and the first 30 chapters of Moby Dick in 15 minutes. They ran a series of tests on me. The physical tests were fun. They made me juggle three balls, then four, then six. I had no problem keeping six balls in the air because they seemed to be moving so slowly. It was boring, frankly, waiting for each ball to move through its arc so I could catch it and toss it back into the air. They threw Cheerios in the air and I caught them with chopsticks. They dropped a handful of coins and I counted the total value before they hit the ground. The cognitive, cognitive tests were less fun, but very illuminating. Finish a 50 word, 50 word word search in three seconds. Solve an intricate maze drawn onto a poster sized paper, two seconds. View a side slideshow projected at 10 images per second and, the ans and answer detailed questions about what I saw. I got 95% correct. 
They told me I measured over 250 on the Knopf scale. Apparently that's deep into superhuman range of thinking speeds. Then they sent me home. It'll wear off in a few hours, they said, which will seem like days to you. Try to use the residual effects to get some work done. Catch up on work emails while you're still in high speed mode. Um, I can tell you guys right now, I don't think he's going to use this time to catch up on work emails. But yeah. that's just a, a <laughs> sneaking suspicion. Um, Alright, so the ride home was horrible. It was only three metro stops, and in real world time, it only took about 35 minutes. But in my drug accelerated hyper time, it felt like days. Days. Just walking out of the medical research suite to the elevator seemed like it took an hour. I sprinted out of the office, willing my legs to push me faster, but the laws of biomechanics held me prisoner. As accelerated as my brain was, I couldn't do anything to make my legs work faster. The huge disconnect between my body and mind made it extremely difficult to judge how, how and when to slow down, turn, or rotate my body. I had basically turned into a giant slow motion spaz. I misjudged my speed and rammed into the wall by the elevator button at a pretty good speed. Even though I could see the wall coming at me, I couldn't make my finger outstretched to hit the elevator button move away fast enough, and I jammed it against the wall hard. The pain was intense. If my brain had been running at regular speed, it probably only would have hurt for 30 seconds or so. But in my accelerated state, the intense pain seemed to last for half an hour, 45 minutes maybe. The elevator ride was horrible. It felt like I spent four or five hours just descending seven floors with nothing to look at but the interior of the elevator car. I sprinted to the metro station. I have to admit, this part was almost fun. Even though my body moved at what seemed to me super slow speed, I could still carefully choose how and where to place my feet, swing my arms, and turn my torso. It only took a block or two to getting used to having a brain that ran two dozen times faster than my body. Then I basically sprint danced the rest of the way, twisting and juking between people on the sidewalk and dodge, dodging moving cars within inches, aka minutes, of clearance. So what do you think, Andre? Is this more of a superpower or a or a curse? Uh, so far? this is definitely a curse. <laughs> I'm okay. just I can I can tell this is not gonna turn out right. So <laughs> all right. Well, let's see. I spent an hour in my time frame descending into the subway and running to the platform. Endless tedium, waiting for the six minutes for the red line train to arrive. Although there was more to look at on the metro platform than inside the elevator, it was still intensely boring. I should have stolen that copy of Moby Dick. The red line train roared into the station in slow motion. The normally high-pitched squeal of its brakes was frequency shifted by my high-speed mind to a long, low tone, hmm. like a monotone tuba solo. It wasn't just the squealing subway train that was three octaves lower than normal. All sound was slowed to the point of near inaudibility. Voices were gone, shifted below the threshold frequency of my hearing. I did manage to hear a screaming baby on my subway car. Her shriek slowed to sound like whale songs. Sh sharp sounds like uh, car horns and trucks bouncing over potholes were low, muddied roars like distant thunder. Back at the research offices, I could still hear and communicate with the research staff, but now verbal communication with anyone would be impossible. The effects of the drug were still intensifying. I spent what seemed like days on that fucking red line train, days, listening to the whale song of the screaming baby and the tuba solo of the brakes, where ordinary voices were frequency shifted out of my audio range. Smells, smells didn't seem to be affected. I never became nose blind to the body odor, the stench of the train's brakes, the melange of farts and other smells wafting through the metro car. I finally got back to my apartment, sprinting through my open door and into the front hall at full speed was like a slow relaxing drift down a lazy river i was relieved to be home at least i had stuff i could do there i picked up the book i was reading 100 years of solitude and finished it despite turning the pages so quickly that i tore many of them it seemed like most of the time i spent finishing the book was spent on page turning and not actually reading three minutes had passed since i got home <laughs> i tried surfing the internet uh, but it was too frustratingly slow. Hours to load each new page and a fraction of a second to read it. A hundred articles in my newsfeed read and just three more minutes done. Man, this is a, uh, I, this is pretty uh, shitty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this sounds terrible. <laughs> I dipped into my pile of yet-to-be-read books and finished two more. Four more minutes had passed. 
I decided to try to sleep off the remaining effects of the drug. Unfortunately, whatever part of my mind is responsible for perception, the part that's been accelerated to hyperspeeds by the drug isn't the same as the part that governs sleep. Despite being awake for what I perceived as days, my physical brain still thought it was 1.25 p.m. It was not ready for sleep. Nevertheless, I tried to sleep. I walked to my bedroom, a slow 45 minute drift through my apartment, and flung myself into bed. I closed my eyes and lay there for hours and hours, which was 10 minutes of reality time, before giving up. Sleep would not come. I was facing what was going to feel like days or maybe even weeks of being trapped in slow motion prison. So I took an Ambien. The sensation of the pill and the splash of water I used to swallow it sliding my throat was sickening. A lump that blocked my breathing, moving like a slug down my esophagus. I read a book. Ten minutes had passed. I read another. Eighteen minutes since I took the Ambien. I threw the book across the room in disgust at my situation. The book slowly pirouetted and spun through the air like a leaf blowing in a breeze. It hit the wall with a long faint rumble, the only sound I had heard for what seemed like hours, then drifted to the floor like a flip-flop sinking in a swimming pool. The force of gravity hadn't changed since I took the pill. The laws of physics were the same. It was just my perception of time that had gone wackadoo. This meant I could use the speed things seemed to fall as a way of judging the effects of the drug. Based on how long it took the book to drift to the floor, I estimated the effects of the drug were still intensifying. I read a magazine, I turned on the TV, I clearly saw each frame of video like I was watching a slideshow. <laughs> Jesus. F frustrated, I turned the television off. I read some more, the first two books of Churchill's A History of the English, not exactly a light read. Frankly, I hated it, but given the hours of tedium it would take to go get another book off my bookshelf, just sitting on the couch and reading Churchill was better, or at least less worse. It had now been 35 minutes since I took the Ambien. I lay down on the couch and closed my eyes. Time passed. I inhaled. An hours-long process. Time passed. I exhaled for more hours. <laughs> Jeez. Sleep would not come. I needed a new plan. I decided to go back to the offices where they gave me the drug. Maybe they would have something that could counteract its effects, or at least something to knock me out until it wore off. I exited my apartment as fast as possible, taking hours in my time frame to do so. I didn't even bother locking the door. It would have taken too long. Down the stairs, it's faster than the elevator if you run, through the lobby, out the front door, and onto the street. These few things felt like a long day at the office. Sprinting down the street, dancing and weaving between pedestrians with what, what must have looked to them superhuman dexterity. Down the first flight of stairs at the metro, across the landing, another hour. Then on to the second flight of stairs, that's when the Ambien hit me. Now the Ambien didn't make me sleepy, not at all. Instead it must have had a severe cross reaction with the experimental drug I took this morning. I was bounding down the second flight of stairs, moving in slow motion, but still making perceptible progress, then wham, everything stopped. The dull roar, roar of the street and metro noise ceased, replaced by the most perfect silence I've ever experienced. My downwards motion seemed to completely freeze before the ambient kicked in. Before the ambient kicked in, my perception of time was maybe a few hundred times slower than real time. After the ambient took effect, time moved thousands of times slower. Every second seemed like days to me. Even just moving my eyes to focus on a new point was like an impossibly slow scroll across my visual field. Over the course of this afternoon, I learned how to walk, run, and jump when my mind ran hundreds of times faster than my body, but with another four or five orders of magnitude of slowdown caused by the Ambien, body control was almost impossible. I fell on the stairs, even though I was all but frozen in mid-step, controlling my muscles was impossible. I commanded my foot forwards for hours, then, com then backwards for hours more when it seemed like I would miss the next step. Hours attempting to adjust the angle of my ankle, then readjusting when it felt wrong. Holy cow. <laughs> Despite these effects, I rolled my ankle on the next step. The pain wasn't at all mitigated by the slowness. Hours of increasing strain on my bent ankle, the nerve signals that send pain into the brain must work differently than the nerves in my ear. Sonic energy was spread out over time, diluted until it was imperceptible. Pain flowed into my brain undiluted by the change in my perception of time. Hours and hours of increasing weight on my turned ankle 
turn into hours of increasing pain upon increasing pain. So, not a superpower, I'm guessing? Yeah, no, definitely not. <laughs> I pitched forwards, my high-speed mind completely unable to control my low-speed body. I drifted downwards for days, managing to rotate my torso enough to keep my head from impacting the ground first. I eventually landed on my right shoulder. At first, the impact wasn't even noticeable. Then I felt a slight pressure in my shoulder as it came in contact with the ground. The pressure grew, bringing increasing pain for hour upon hour. My shoulder finally gave out, popping out of its socket with an endless, sickening tug. I came to a stop days later, crumpled on the ground, staring at the ceiling, the pain in my shoulder still screaming with the intensity of a fresh, violent injury. I had plenty of time to think during that fall. <laughs> if every second seemed like days to me, then each minute of real world time would be like years. Even if the drug cleared out of my system in the next two or three hours, this nightmare would seem to last centuries. I can't imagine being trapped like that. Yeah, that's, no. that's what, this is why I picked this one. It's just <laughs> this is scary. Well, that's scary. That that's what scares you. Not little <laughs> fucking creatures with knives running around no. your house. <laughs> By the time I hit the ground, I had a plan. I would somehow get to the platform and throw myself in front of a train. I twisted onto my hands and knees, days of my dislocated shoulder crying for relief. I misjudged my rotation and rolled onto my back. I tried again, collapsing onto my face as I tried to figure out how to control a body that moved slower than grass grew. Weeks of effort were finally rewarded with success. I stabilized on my hands and knees. If just getting on all fours was this difficult, I figured that walking or running was completely out of the question, so I crawled. I crawled through the metro tunnel. The dumb looks on the faces in the crowd lingered on me for weeks. I crawled under the turnstile and onto the escalator. The escalator spilled the rush hour crowd onto the platform at the same speed a glacial spills ice into the sea. I looked out over the crowded platform during my interminable downward ride. The train status sign said the next train wouldn't arrive for 20 minutes. 20 minutes was like a year to me. I'd have to spend a year on the metro platform waiting to die. I crawled off the escalator, enduring, stupid, <laughs> enduring days of stupid expressions on the commuters' faces. I crawled a few feet to a concrete bench and curled up next to it, trying to find a position to lessen the pain in my shoulder. Then my problem with time got worse. Impossibly worse. The massive slowdown on the stairs was just the beginning of the interaction between the experimental drug and the Ambien. It fully hit me when I was curled up by the bench. I blinked. Years of darkness followed. Sound was already gone, and with my blink, sight was gone as well. All that existed was the pain from my fall. My hyper-accelerated mind wasted no time compensating for the lack of sensory input. Voices spoke to me. They sung to me in languages that never existed. Patterns and faces and colors came and went with my mind's eye. I recalled my whole life and imagined living another. I forgot English. I settled into a profound despair. I spoke to God. I became God. I imagined a new universe and brought it to life with my thoughts. Then I did it all again and again. My eyes opened with geologic slowness. A faint glow, weeks, a slit of light, weeks, a narrow view of the metro platform, ankles of the commuters near me, and an advertisement on the opposite wall. So that was all in the time frame of him blinking. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I extracted my phone from my pocket, a project that spanned decades. How can I even explain the boredom? The pain in my shoulder is nothing compared to the boredom. Every thought I can think, I have thought hundreds of times already. The view of ankles and advertisements never changes. Never. The boredom is so intense it's tangible, like a solid object of metal and stone wedged into my skull. Inescapable. What are my options? If I crawl and fall onto the tracks without an oncoming train to crush me, I won't die. I'll experience even more pain from the forefoot fall but I'll most likely be rescued by some do-gooder on the platform and unable to act when the train finally does arrive. My suffering in that scenario will be endless. So I wait for the train, so I can throw myself under it. When it finally hits me, I will experience the pain of being ripped to pieces for centuries until finally the light of life leaves my brain and my experience ends. I've lived hundreds of lifespans at the foot of this bench. I am far older in spirit than any human who has ever lived, most of my life experience has been a snapshot of pain huddled on the floor of a subway platform with an unchanging view of ankles and advertisements. 
This post is my plan B, my Hail Mary, my long shot. I've spent lifetimes typing and posting this message in the hope that someone will read it and become convinced that my suffering must end. Someone on this platform right now, someone who will find the man curled under the bench, the man who crawled down the escalator and kill him as swiftly as possible, a bullet to the temple. If you're armed and at Glenmont Metro, please shoot me. Wow, that one was a kind of <laughs> kind of long, but it uh, it kind of it scared me when I read it. It was it it, it scared me. It reminded me of uh, have you seen Black Mirror? Like all yes. the episodes. Yes. Do you you know the one I'm talking about where she's like trapped in the home, like the smart home device, and they like shut her off for like yeah, and the little like monkey. Yeah. Y- yeah, yeah, dude, that's that's, wow. that's what spooks Jared, huh? Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> that that one really hit me. Um, Interesting. Yeah, I guess that is pretty terrifying, isn't it? <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Well, I mean, hopefully that drug doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. If it does, I'll make sure to never slip it into your pocket. <laughs> um. Damn. Damn. What that do you got next crazy. for us, Andre? Um. Let's see. I I have two short ones. Um. <clears throat> two short ones that I want to share with you. The first one is uh, one of my all-time favorites for sure, and it's Candle Cove. Have you ever heard of Candle Cove? No, I haven't. Okay, so Candle Cove was actually a copy of pasta that was written uh, in a blog post format, kind of like a, kind of like a Reddit-style format. Like, there's a bunch of people, there's a thread, there's someone posting something, and there's a bunch of people responding to it. So I'm going to try my best to read this uh, the best way that I can. Uh, but... Yeah, so just 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 try to keep track. So, this is on the fictional Net Nostalgia forum under the category Television Local, and user Skyshell zero three three posts Candle Cove local kids show. Does anyone remember this kids show? It was called Candle Cove, and it must have been six or seven. I never found reference to it anywhere, so I think it was on a local station around nineteen seventy one or nineteen seventy two. I lived in Ironton at the time. I don't remember which station, but I do remember it was on a weird on at a weird time, like 4 p.m. Mike Painter 65 says, "It seems really familiar to me. I grew up outside of Ashland and was nine years old in '72. Candle Cove was it about pirates? I remember a pirate marionette at the mouth of a cave talking to a little girl." Skyshell says, "Yes, okay, I'm not crazy. I remember Pirate Percy. I was always kind of scared of him. He looked like he was built from parts of other dolls, like real low budget." His head was an old porcelain baby doll. looked like an antique that didn't belong on the body. I don't remember what station this was. I don't think it was local station, though, that we're thinking of. To which Jerome2005 says, Sorry to resurrect this old thread, but I know exactly what you mean, Skyshell. I think Candle Cove ran for only a couple months in 1971, not 72. I was 12 and I watched it a few times with my brother. It was channel 58, whatever station that was. My mom would let me switch it to um, switch to it after the news. It took place in Candle Cove, I think, and it was about a little girl who imagined herself to be friends with pirates, right? The pirate ship was called the Laughing Stock, and Pirate Percy wasn't a very good pirate because he got scared too easily. And there was a Calliope music constantly playing. I don't remember the girl's name, Janice or Jade or something. I think it was Janice, to which Skyshell says... Thank you, Jaren. Memories flooded back when you mentioned the laughing stock in Channel 58. I remember the bow of the ship was a wooden smiling face with a lower jaw submerged. It looked like it was a swallowing the sea, and it had that awful Edwin voice and laugh. I especially remember how jarring it was when they switched from the wooden slash plastic model to the foam puppet version of the head that talked. Mike Painter 65 says, Haha, <laughs> I remember now too. Do you remember this part, Skyshell? You have to go inside skyshell says oh mike i got a chill reading that yes i remember that's what the ship always told percy when there was a spooky place he had to go in like a cave or like a dark room where the treasure was and the camera would push in on laughing stock's face with each pause you have to go inside with his two eyes askew and that flopping foam jaw and the fishing line that opened and closed it ugh it just looks so cheap and awful. You guys remember the villain? He had a face that was just on like a handlebar mustache above really tall, narrow teeth. 
Kevin Hart says, "Oh, Kevin Hart." <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, honestly thought the villain was Pirate Percy. I was about five when this show was on Nightmare Fuel. Jaren 2005 says, "That wasn't the villain, the puppet with the mustache. That was the villain's sidekick. Horror is horrible. He had a monocle too, but it was on top of the mustache. I used to think that meant he had only one eye." But yeah, the villain was another marionette, the Skin Taker. I can't believe what they let us watch back then. Oh my then. God! Kevin Hart says, "Jesus H Christ, the Skin Taker! What kind of a kid show are we watching?" I seriously could not look at the screen when the Skin Taker showed up. He just descended out of nowhere on his strings, just a dirty skeleton wearing that brown top hat and cape, and his glass eyes that were too big for his skull. <laughs> Christ Almighty! Sky Shell says wasn't his stop hat and cloak all sewn up crazily was that supposed to be children's skin mike painter 65 <laughs> says yeah i think so remember his mouth didn't open and close his jaw just slid back and forth i remember the little girl said why does your mouth move like that and the skin taker didn't look at the girl but at the camera and said to grind your skin <laughs> sky shell says i'm so relieved that other people remember this terrible show I used to have this awful memory, a bad dream I had, where the opening jingle ended, the show faded in from black, and all the characters were there, but the camera was just cutting to each of their faces, and they were just screaming, and the puppets and marionettes were flailing spastically and just all screaming, screaming. The girl was just moaning and crying like she had been through hours of this. I woke up many times from that nightmare. I used to wet the bed when I had it. Kevin says. I don't think that was a dream. I remember that. I remember that was an episode. Mmm. Skyshell says that's not possible. There was no plot or anything. I mean, literally just standing in place, crying and screaming for the whole show. Kevin says maybe I'm manufacturing the memory because you said that, but I swear to God, I remember seeing what you described. They just screamed. Jaren says, "Oh God, yes, the, the little girl Janice. I remember seeing her shake and the skin taker screaming through his gnashing teeth, his jaw careening so wildly. I thought it would come off its wire hinges. I turned it off, and it was the last time I watched. Actually, I ran to tell my brother, and we didn't have the courage to turn it back on." Mike Painter sixty five says, "I visited my mom today at the nursing home." I asked her about when I was little in the early 70s, when I was eight or nine, and if she remembered a kid's show, Candle Cove. She said she was surprised I could remember that, and I asked why, and she said, because I used to think it was so strange that you said, I'm gonna go watch Candle Cove now, Mom, and then you would turn the TV to static and just watch dead air for 30 minutes. You had a big oh imagination with your little pirate show. Oh my god. <laughs> I like that. I like that you didn't really know until the last the last response. Isn't that fucking creepy? Every time yeah. I read that, and I've read this so many times, it makes my hair stand up. I just hate it. I hate it. I detest <laughs> the story. I hate the idea that, like, whatever these... Like, I mean, I, I hate the idea that all these kids were just, like, watching Static when they were little. And, like, what the fuck? Was, like, something actually showing, but only kids could watch it? Was it some kind of fucking government experiment? Like, I don't know. Uh -huh. um, no, that's super creepy. I like that you like one. that? Yeah, no, I like that. I like the format, too. I pulled it up on my screen so I could follow it. And, oh, yeah, okay, okay, okay. That's pretty cool. Don't read till the end till I read it, okay? Oh, I, I didn't. <laughs> Because I'm gonna do another short one. This is this is this is also a really popular one. You might have not heard of it though. It's called "I'm a 911 Operator." Just had the most terrifying call. Have you heard of that? No. Okay. This is also really popular. You can follow along if you wish. Um, but yeah, I love it. The format's also just it's a very very peculiar format, and it's it's pretty pretty short but pretty effective. So, 911, what's your emergency? Yeah, hi. Um, this is going to sound kind of strange, but there's a man stumbling around in circles in my front yard. Could you repeat that, sir? He looks sick or lost or drunk or something. I just woke up to get a glass of water and heard snow crunching around underneath my front window, so I peeked out. I'm looking at him now. He's about 10 yards away from my window. Something's not right. What's your address, sir? 1617 Quarry Lane in Pinella Pass. I'm going to send a squad car your way, but that's quite a ways out. Are you alone in your house, sir? Yes, I'm alone. Can you confirm that all of your doors and windows are locked? Stay on the phone with me. I know that my front is definitely locked, but I'll go check my back door again really quick. 
I appreciate your help, by the way. I know this is kind of strange, but I really hope that... Sir? Are you still there? He's... He's still in the yard? But... He's... <laughs> what the fuck? He's... He's upside down? Sir? Stay on with me. What is happening? He's staring right at me, but he's... He's standing on his hands now. He's perfectly still staring straight at me. He's doing a handstand and he's smiling and he's not moving. He's doing a handstand, sir. I don't know. He, he's facing me and he's standing on his hands and he's got his huge smile and he's perfectly still. What the fuck? Please get someone out here now. Sir, I need you to remain calm. I've put up the call and an officer is on his way. His teeth are so huge. What the fuck? Please help me. Sir, I want you to try and keep an eye on him, but make sure your back door is locked again. We need to make sure all possible access points are secured. Can you talk me through and confirm that your back door is locked? Uh, okay, I'm walking backwards now and keeping him in my sight. My hand is on the back doorknob now. It's locked. I need to check the deadbolt, so I'm going to take my eyes off him for a split second. All right, sir. Help us on the way. Just stay on the phone with me. Everything's going to be all right. Sir? Sir? Are you still there? His face, it's up against the glass. Sir, I need you to speak up. What's happening? I looked away for a split second and now his face, it's pressed up against my front window. His teeth are huge and he's still smiling. There's no color in his eyes. Jesus, please help me. Why won't it just fucking move? Sir, I need you to go to the nearest room and lock yourself inside of it. Do you have a basement or a bedroom that you can lock yourself in? He won't stop staring. He's going to hurt me. Sir... I need you to listen to me. Lock yourself somewhere safe until the officer arrives at your house. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I'm going to lock myself in my room now. And you're positive that you're alone in your house, correct? Yes, I'm alone in my house. Wait a moment. He's moving. He's shaking his head. He's telling me no. You can hear us. He's telling me I'm not alone. Sir! <laughs> Sir, are you still there? I heard a loud noise. Is everything alright? Sir? And scene. Bravo, Andre. If uh, your first story wasn't very immersive, this was the opposite. That was some <laughs> good reading. <laughs> I was trying, I was trying. Um, I love the story. The, of what I said earlier, it's just very... It's it's short and sweet and simple. I, I guess just like the first story that I read, I like stories that are very self-contained. Uh -huh. They're very encapsulated within their environment, and that's it. I like your story too, but like the difference in that story, I wouldn't call that encapsulated in the sense that it's very much... The guy goes from here to here, and now he's at his house, and now he's at the train station, and it's... Uh -huh. I guess it's also just by virtue of being a longer story you know you have to have more more stuff but i just like i like short and sweet because they they leave you with so many questions that yeah, <laughs> it's like it scares me and i like i like, I like the i like the medium of it too with the 911 call yeah I, I like peculiar mediums too like the blog posts like the 911 calls one of my favorite ones is this one this one, this one is really long though so i didn't want to read it um i think it, it was turned into a novel actually uh remember the name but it's about it's about this oh my god i remember that it's about this boy he has a diary and he writes in it for years about how he's being stalked by this guy he's like a teen and he's being stalked by this like this 40 year old man and it's chapters and chapters and chapters and um uh it was like posted on no sleep at first i sorry i gotta remember the name um but it was so successful that the author eventually like self-published it into an actual pa paperback um uh -huh. So cool stuff. I'll, I'll send it to you if I find it. You might like it. It's it's really it's terrifying and it's really grounded in reality. So that only makes it more heart wrenching. Yeah, send it my way. Alrighty. So what you got for us now? What's the name of your story? <laughs> uh, my father punished me when I talked to ghosts. You go. I've been blind since birth. As I grew up, everything was described to me in such vivid detail that I didn't even realize why it was that important to see, especially having no reference point to compare it. We lived in a single floor ranch house, that's what father told me. In my mind, of course, I could see, although unlike how a sighted person could, I had spatial awareness. 
I knew where my bedroom was, where the bathroom, living room, and kitchen were. Each wall had its own texture. I don't know if that was done on purpose or if I could feel things others never noticed. I rarely fell over. Only a father or one of the visitors put something somewhere they shouldn't have. It was usually the visitors, and father would shout. They visited infrequently, and only briefly when they did. Father said I shouldn't speak to them, that it unsettled him. He'd worry when I saw something he didn't, saw it with my ears or by touch. Ellie was the first. She seemed very sweet. She asked me my name and why my face was so messed up. She was in the living room. I could hear where she sat from her breaths, harsh nasal sounds as if her nose was blocked. When father had a cold, he'd always breathe through his mouth, big labored breaths, as he wasn't used to it. When people mentioned my face, I always touched it, trying to work out why it was so strange to them. When I asked if I could touch theirs, there was always a pause. I guess sighted people never did that. Why would they need to? When I asked Ellie if I could touch her face, she reluctantly agreed. But moments later, father entered the room and asked me who I was speaking to. I told him, nobody. He would always punish me when I spoke about them. I think it scared him. He'd take my arm and march me off. I'd be knocked off balance and disoriented to the point where he finally set me down. My hands would frantically search my surroundings until I knew where I was. It was usually my bedroom, though every now and then he'd leave me outside in the middle of nowhere. That was the worst. I would be lost and scared. He told me about the road that ran in front of the house and explained that the sounds I heard were cars, that they'd kill me if they touched me. Those sounds were my only means of recognizing my surroundings. I waited until I heard one and then knew which way to run back to the house. I heard Ellie that evening. She whispered to me, saying she was scared. I whispered back, but she didn't hear. I asked father about Ellie. He didn't want to talk about her. I asked why. He didn't reply. When I told him that she asked about my face, he asked me how I responded. I told him I wanted to touch hers. He laughed, though I knew he wasn't happy. I could hear the difference. When you laugh for pleasure, your mouth is wide open. When you pretend, your mouth is almost closed. To me, the difference is obvious. It wasn't until I was older that he explained. He said we lived in a special place connected to the other world. That sometimes dead people slipped through, people who died in pain and wanted to reach the living. He explained that because I couldn't see, I was able to tune into that. That they knew I was listening when others weren't. He said I had to ignore it, otherwise, he told me, they'd latch on and never leave me. All the dead want to do is to be alive again, he said. It was dangerous, and they would trick me. He said he knew how to deal with them, but he couldn't help if they became attached to me. Alex appeared to me a few years later. She told me she was lost and didn't know where she was. I told her I wasn't allowed to speak to her. Still, she pleaded for help. I kept quiet, knowing what would happen if I said anything. Did you speak to them? Father asked. Though I was upset, I told him no. I wished I could help her. I knew what it was like to be lost, and it scared me. Alex didn't whisper to me at all. I had ignored her, and she ignored me. Father saved me, and I was thankful. After Alex, I knew what I needed to do, so I did it. The spirit stopped bothering me after that for a very long time. That was until Sarah appeared. Sarah didn't give me a chance to be quiet. I was on my own, sitting in the living room and listening to the television. Help, she said. I need to find a way out. I stayed silent. You can hear me, can't you? She asked, surprised. I'm not allowed to speak to you, I told her. Please, she begged. I'm scared. I'm lost. I want to see my daddy. I gripped the arms of the chair and told her I wasn't allowed. He's dead, she said. I didn't answer. Your father is dead, she said again. I wasn't going to fall for it. I heard banging from around the room as things began to fly and the shelves began to shake. Stop it, I shouted, and it did. Please help me leave, she said. I wasn't going to talk to her. I did the only thing I thought would help. I unlocked the front door, hoping she'd run out and get lost, just like I would do. When I heard from her no more, I locked the door and sat back down. I listened intently for any sign she was still there. Except for the sounds of the TV, it was silent. I hated when my heart raced. I became all too aware of the TikTok feeling and the rise and fall within my chest like it was about to explode. When I heard my father's voice, I screamed. Son, he said, I need your help. I think I'm dying. I did what he told me to do. I didn't speak. If he did die, he'd never leave me. Instead, I raced out into the open air and shouted for help. 
I shouted until my voice was hoarse. I heard the sounds of cars racing along the road in front of my house. I shouted until I heard someone respond. It was a woman. What's wrong? They asked. I told them I think my father was dying. They asked what happened to my face. I pleaded with them to help me, and they promised they would. I sat down on the grass and waited. Sometime later, the woman returned to me and asked if she could hold my hand. I'm so sorry, she told me. I heard the sounds of sirens and of people rushing. I asked what was going on. The woman said she was there for me. As the noise died down, a man asked me a question. I'm a paramedic, he said. What happened to your face? I told him I was fine. He asked if I was sure, and I told him I was. He asked if I minded him touching my face. I said it was okay. A moment later, I felt a pressure release from around my forehead, and the air felt cold against my skin. It sounded as if he were peeling an orange. I imagined that in my head and worried he'd expose my insides. I screamed and asked him what he was doing. He told me everything was going to be okay, and the woman squeezed my hand, telling me to be brave. I didn't know what I was experiencing. I felt a tight pain within my head, like when you smash your shin against something hard, followed by something I'd come to understand as bright. It hurt so much I began to cry. What happened to your eyes? The paramedic asked. I said I was blind. He asked to check them. The pain returned when he examined them. Do you know him? The man asked the woman who had helped me. She told him that I had been screaming for help and that she had come to my aid, but that she never met me before. How long have you had your eye injury? He asked me. I told him I'd been blind since birth. He asked me if I could see his fingers. I told him no. He asked if I could open my eyes. I said I didn't know what he meant. He asked if he could open them for me. I didn't respond. Then I felt his fingers on my face, fingers covered in something rubbery. Suddenly, it became bright again. I screamed. He tried to calm me. The woman squeezed my hand again. I didn't know what was happening. Things I couldn't describe came to me. It was like it always was, but multiplied 100-fold, and so much more real. I carried on screaming as a fuzzy form came into view. Just breathe, okay? The paramedic said. Everything will be fine. When was the last time you saw? As my heart began to, calm, began to calm and my breathing slowed, I became distracted by what I was experiencing. It overwhelmed me. I wanted to cry, and I did. How long has it been? He asked again. I've never seen anything before, I told him. I was told to keep an eye mask on for most of the day, only taking it off at night at first to allow my eyes time to adjust. At the same time, I was placed in the custody of my aunt and uncle and didn't even know it at first. They were shocked at what happened to me and that I had never attended school. The past few years have been a roller coaster ride. The doctor said I may never have perfect vision, though what little I have is a godsend and I'll take what I can get. I've only recently been learning to read and write, so I apologize if my English isn't the greatest. It's the best I can do. I've been asking my aunt what happened to my father, but all she said, all she says is that he died of a heart attack. I asked what sort of man he was. She says he was her brother and she'll love him no matter what. My uncle doesn't want to talk about him at all. I've been using the computer a lot recently and I'm really enjoying the internet. I can't believe such a thing exists after being so lonely for so long. I can talk to whoever I want when I want, though I'm wary of that. After all, how do I know if I'm speaking to, if who I'm speaking to is alive? No one seems to share my father's concerns about that. Today I was on a forum discussing the spirit world. I was so happy to find people who I could relate to, and someone curious about my username sent me a link to an article on a true crime website. It was about my father, and mentioned me by name. They asked me who I was, and if I was the same person. According to the article, my mother had gone missing soon after my birth. It said I'd been bound so that I couldn't see, that my father always wanted a daughter. They found 14 bodies in the basement. They said one got away, a girl by the name of Sarah Frank. She was the one to call the police. They found father's car parked around the back of the house. They supposed he carried his victims into the basement via the storm entrance and left them there. Sarah had managed to get away after she agreed to be his daughter following four days of sustained torture. She stabbed him with a knife he'd placed on the counter to butter some toast. I didn't want to believe it, and I'm not sure I would have, if it weren't for the names of the victims, two of which stuck out, Ellie Farmer and Alex Riddle. I'd spoken to them both in the living room. To this day, I wonder if my father had been honest with me about a single thing in his life. Throughout it all, one question remains above all others. 
Did I speak to Ellie and Alex before or after he killed them? And end scene. Ooh. Creepy. Mm. I, I think I kind of saw someone like this coming. Uh -huh. Like, and, and, and I definitely thought at the beginning, no, they're not dead. The kid's probably just not allowed to speak to other children. He's probably, yeah, he's probably being held, kidnapped. Like, I thought something like that, mm -hmm. but I didn't I didn't think it was going to be all that. Yeah. And also, I didn't think that, you know, the possibility might still exist that he was talking to them after he, they were dead. Yeah. Um, I liked it was a mix yeah. of, like, a, it was a mix of, like, physical, like, horror and then like a little bit of supernatural mystery at the end but i think i think like because you know how sarah is like can you open the front door for me like uh -huh. i wonder if because like clearly she could stab a grown man like she had no problem doing that uh -huh. um so like why would she need like the kid to open a door for her it could be because he had a key and only he did or something or but I don't think he used the key. I don't think he even would be allowed one. Um, yeah. So I think it, she was probably dead. And, like, opening the door for her was, like, the symbolic, like, letting her pass. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a good she point. She needed that. That's interesting. Anyways, that's all I got. <laughs> two long ones. Two, two, no, two that, that was ones. good, though. That was good. I, I, I liked them, especially the second one. It was really good. But the mm -hmm. first one, I can tell it really terrified you. So, you know, <laughs> it's effective for you. It's effective. That's, that's what that is. Uh. <laughs> Um, uh, well, y'all, I hope you liked the episode. Um, uh, Jared, thank you very much for joining me. No, sure thing. I'm happy to be here, dude. Um, thanks for inviting me on um, and kind of introducing me to a topic that I've never really looked at. I've read more <laughs> creepypasta stories in the past two days than I've ever had before. So it's pretty oh, interesting. There's, yeah, there's definitely some good ones out there. And, I, and I'll send you more just for your entertainment um, yes, after please. this. But um, uh, everybody, if you have topic suggestions for future episodes, please do send them to us uh, at Talk Scary on Twitter and Instagram or at Scary Talk on Facebook. That is our page. Also remember that you can follow us um, on those platforms and that you can find this podcast on any and all podcast listening platforms that is uh stitcher spotify apple Podcasts, google podcasts wherever you listen to podcasts we're there um and that's that we will well at least i certainly will <laughs> um be talking to you in the very near future and i hope that all of you have a very good night remember the mothman is real and don't eat any large meals before bedtime <laughs> thank you all and good night adios